our sport is not an invasion game it's a collision game okay you are quite literally colliding with each other you know and you look at the gps data and they're like having 40 mile an hour car crashes some of them when they hit each other properly it was really interesting she she came over to me she went i think if we'd have had you we wouldn't have lost the final in the way that we did i've never once thought oh that person shouldn't be on but oh that, that person's you know pushing it here you know the, the complete trust is with with the doctors yeah you gotta have these soft skills know how to talk to people i can go over to this person and give them a bit of a bollocking i can go over to this person and i've got to be really gentle with them you know have them people skills Andrew Rains, we're live. Welcome to the podcast. Cheers, thank you for having me. And my first question is, how did your journey start within performance analysis? I was a teacher at school uh, in Lancaster, um, but I was always good with IT, etc. and the bosses knew that. And then what's happened one day is my boss has come over with, uh, well, what is now a very old Apple Mac. And it had Game Breaker on at the time, like, um, and that was like the first ever time I'd ever seen performance analysis. Um, and he's essentially give it to me and go, look, you need to learn how to use this because you're going to teach it to students. And I was like, fine, you know, uh, really happy to do that. Um, and then all of a sudden, like this, this whole new world opened up. Um, you know, people wanted to like know how to use it and stuff like that. Then uh, on the back of that, uh, I was also in touch with some people in rugby and they heard that I was using this and doing that. And they're like, oh, can you come and use that with us? You know, um, and some football people also asked me to to do other bits and bats as well. Uh, I ended up doing some filming at Lancaster City and then trying to do, obviously, some analysis there as well. Um, wasn't to, to any big standard or anything like that. Um, but yeah, back in the day, it was almost like I had access to it because this, you know, it was just in its heyday. So I had access to it. I knew how to use it, even though it was it was quite basic compared to what they have to do. <laughs> you know, it's, it's moved on vastly. Um, and then, yeah, through rugby league channels, uh, ended up uh, Wigan Warriors as, on their scholarship coaching, but again, using some of the software. Um, and then I got a call from their first team at the time, uh, Michael Maguire, as it was. Uh, he says, I believe you know I use this software and uh, you've got access to it. I was like, yeah. Um, you know, some of it was just the access point, but a lot of it is you know how to use it. He says, well, can you come and use it with us? We teach our guys how to use it and do this. So I ended up in there and then uh, and then ended up uh, at St. Helens as well, um, doing something a little bit different, but still using performance analysis as sort of the basis. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit of a up and down. I don't think that, that journey would ever exist today. You know, there's lots of more different avenues. People are much more aware of performance analysis. But at the time, it was like... Yeah, you, you presented with this laptop. I mean, yeah, it was like, you know, a big brick compared to what we have now. Some software on it, and it's like, oh, right, okay. You know, and I love the IT. I learned how to do it pretty quick, and yeah, it was it was good. So I suppose, like, it was just a, one encounter that led me led me down this path, and then, yeah, to other places. Talk to me about the advancement then. So obviously you mentioned that... Um the different tools that you might have used at the beginning have very much changed and even the element of employability has changed as you yeah. kind of alluded to. Talk to me about the advancement within um, rugby league, obviously that being your sport, how that yeah. has modified through the use of technology and different apparatus to support that analysis process. Yeah, I think a lot of the technology drives performance analysis. Um you know, it's, it's obviously I work in academia as well and it's probably one of the only areas that Again, the technology drives the academia. It's not the other way around. And the technology drives the practices. Um, so yeah, in, in the in the first day, you're quite literally had one laptop. It could deal with one angle. You know, you could only have so many tags, uh, you know, of what you code and stuff like that. So it was, it was quite limited, but still at the time really advanced. You know, it was really good to sort of go through, you know, start breaking stuff down and doing replays and... You know, you're not having to wait however long for a VHS tape to turn up, and you know, because <laughs> you know that's what it was. Um, so I mean, like now, everything's instant. You know, it's great. Um, so, so obviously at St Helens with my role, quite literally, sit down with a laptop. I have an SDI feed. I can have multiple angles. It's it's there and it's quick. It's processed quick. 
do multiple taggings. I can send that information to other people if I want to. You know, um, I, I value it on the pitch, uh, uh, pitch side sometimes on an iPad. I just bump, send some information to them. Uh, you know, that, and it's just gone big like that just for a performance and analyst. Um, then on the back of it, what we're starting to do now is integrate GPS data, you know, so they can then, uh, well, they, they are sort of, you can sync them together. So if you see a tackle, for example, in on, on the pitch, you can go, right, GPS data, how much G-force is going through that tackle, for example. Um, you know, and obviously if somebody makes a, a sprint, you know, you can track how fast it's going through the GPS data. Mm. So any differences with, with other sports? You mentioned, obviously, you had experiences within football as well as rugby league, and rugby yeah. league is kind of your key sport. Yeah. Is, is, is there any differences that you've come across maybe with your experiences in terms of how analysis is used and any kind of methods or any ways that can that can kind of be uh, utilised to, to support athletes and performance? Yeah. Quite an interesting question. I, I would say process-driven, no, not really. I think the process is, uh, you know, uh, if you're an analyst, you could put, I mean, I've, I have very little knowledge on uh, boxing, for example, but I know if you were to ask me to analyze a boxer, I could just use my techniques to do it. And obviously the the bit I'm missing is like the key performance indicators and stuff like that. Um, so process driven in, in, in everything. No, I think it's to the extent of what is done. You know, football is has got everything it needs. You know, uh, sometimes when I speak to data companies, they actually think the, the stuff's saturated. It's used that much uh, within what they're doing. Um, so in terms of differences that way, particularly not process, is is all the same. You know, um, but yeah, football is just multiple angles, lots of data, lots of data companies, you know, lots of people trying innovative stuff. So like the VR stuff now coming in through the football which is, is not seen in the rugby, uh, not yet. Um, I assume it will be, um, obviously, from, from what I know of in it anyway. Um, but, yeah, so I think yeah, I think that's that's what the, the variance is. You said um, the fact that uh, feedback and footage and data can be quite instant. Do you see a difference in maybe athletes at all? Do you, are athletes more demanding in that process? I'm intrigued on that because people yeah. that might be listening or watching this might go, yeah. I want to kind of entail a career within this area. Yeah. Um, what about your relationship with like, athletes? How does that come about in terms of their, their nature towards the area? Yeah, so, so if I talk about my time um, at St. Helens with the, the females with the, on the women's section, you know, I spent maybe three years with them and I had a really good relationship. That, that was probably my best in terms of analyst-player relationship. Um, you know, fantastic girls, by the way. Um, it's really interesting when you listen to the athletes, what they think of analysis. You know, um, it, it interesting, if I, I'll, I'll try not to use a name, but um, I, I left the, the female section to, to join the men's and do what I do now with the HIAs. Um since when I left, they actually lost in a final. It was really interesting. She she came over to me. She went, um, "I think if we'd have had you, we wouldn't have lost the final in the way that we did." And I was like, "All right, okay, interesting. Why? What? What's your engagement with you know the analysis and, and all this?" She says, "Well, I think you'd have shown us what they were doing all the time, and we'd have been able to practice it and do it and stuff like that." So I think players, some players, can really actively engage with it. Um, yeah, um, and I've, I mean, obviously, you're going to get others who you perhaps don't. But uh, from my experience, that that, that relationship's key. Like, and then yeah. you give them feedback and go, right, this is how you can stop that play, or this is how we can make our plays better, or yeah. this is what we did brilliantly and fantastically. Let's keep going, you know. And I think that's that's the engagement side of it. So, so talk to me about that transition into kind of looking at head injuries and how did that come about? Because Again, comparing it to other sports, rugby league seems to emphasise the need to kind of protect its individuals around head injuries. How did that? How did that come about, and how did that become apparent within your career so far? So, so from a personal sort of standpoint, uh, again, I was with the women's section, um, delivering performance analysis, stats, data, everything like that. Um, then, through almost through the sport of rugby league, it came about uh, in terms of insurance-wise. 
that they were starting to struggle to get insurance for the whole game. Um, now, I'm not so sure, and this is not, I'm not sure if we need this in place for insurance purposes, but or the insurance triggered us, whichever way around. But essentially, at every game, all of a sudden it was like, right, we need to have some sort of me metric in place, some performance analysis system that allows us to, to assess head injuries. Um, and I think also for player welfare as well, just moving forward, it, it made absolute sense. So I've got, right, how can we man better manage that? So, you know, I, I would say I was at the women's and all of a sudden this these type of role came up within the club and they, they devised this fantastic role. And obviously they, I don't want to say they pinched me from the women's, uh, you know, because they might not appreciate, the, the women might not appreciate, but, but you know, I obviously transitioned across. Um, and I just, again, took them skills of knowing how to use software, um, you know, how to code and et cetera, and then just applied it right. Instead of, instead of my key performance indicators being tackles, pass, all the rest of it is now injuries. Um, and then from there, it's like, right, let's go on a dis discovery journey. You know, how do you actually assess injuries? How do you do this bit? Um, you know, so I think that's maybe how it transitioned across. Um, also, it, may, it might be worth me saying as well, but I'm not a medical professional. You know, um, my whole role is to work with a doctor, club doctor. Um, and believe it or not as well, it's both the home and away doctor. So even though I do just a St. Helens home game, I do work with, with both the doctors. Um, and again, we sit down together and we will assess certain things and and then carry out certain assessments and send footage to other places and and stuff like that. So I think that's, I think that's how it transitioned. Um, and it's really interesting this year as well that um, before every match, I have to go over to the match commissioner. I have to go, I serve uh, it's working. I have to show them the system working. So even for the start of the game now, this this whole system has to be in place and working and functioning. But um, otherwise, the certain sanctions are in sort of I don't want to say punishments, but the you know that type of thing for for it not being in place. But I think that's why the the, the game also cares about. So how do you assess a head injury? Yeah. Um, so let's let's say now. Uh, I've got a huddle in front of me. Um, I've just seen a head injury on on the screen because um, obviously there might be a time delay, so I usually look at the screen. Um, I will then clip it straight away instantly, so we've got a timeline, a tag, etc. Um, as I'm now starting to rewind the thing, obviously a doctor will come into me, so that could be the home, the away doctor. Um, and now and then we're looking through it for elements such as where was the initial contact made on the head? You know, was it a knee to the head? Was it an elbow? Was it, it was it just a little slap sometimes, you know? <laughs> uh, it could be the ball as well, potentially. I've never seen it in rugby yet where somebody's been struck on the foot. But um, I know it would happen in football, I believe one of the Welsh games. Um, it might have been uh, Williams, I forgot his first name, sorry. But yeah, he took it. So it could potentially be the ball. But yeah, so, but what is, what's caused injury? Then where's the point of contact? And then this is where the analysis comes into it. It happens so quick on a pitch that you can't see if the player is, um, are they aware of their surroundings? So are they looking for the ball still? Are they still looking to make a tackle? You know, are they still looking to protect themselves as they fall? You know, because that can show that cognitive function. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there was, there was one at Magic Weekend, uh, one of our wingers, uh, I, I wasn't there as an assessor, but um, I saw it on the video. He got a little one around the chops. But he's looking up and he's looking, right, have we scored the try? Or have we not? Or, uh, or, or he was in the process of scoring the try as well with, with another one. So it's like that shows some cognitive function, which you can't really always pick up on just by standing on the side of the pitch. So that's, that's some of the key stuff we're looking for, you know. Are they falling out protecting themselves? Um, other stuff then, like how long does it take them to move? You know, um, so... There was a, there was quite a bad one at uh, last season against Salford, and this guy's like out, out. So it's like uh, I laugh, sorry, because he he got up and walked off. You know, I knew I know he's fine, um, but yeah, he was he was gone, and it's then it's like right, well, how long did it take that person to move of their own accord? So again, that's some data that um, the doctors want. You know, um, then how long does it take them to sit, stand up, and stuff like that? 
Um, I've even had match commissioners come over as well and go, how long did it take them to step over the whitewash? Because that's key for us because we have head injury assessment that last, uh, I think it's, I want to say 10 minutes, it might be 15, sorry, it's not what I, I do, but um, so they want to know how, because as soon as you cross that whitewash, your H, HIA step starts and you're off for that amount of time, even if you're, you're fine and stuff. So, um, so yeah, we're looking for that type of stuff. We're also looking for secondary injuries or head knocks. So um, again, that sulfur game was a different impact. Um, one of the players, sulfur players, took a, a, a knock to somebody's hip. So and the tackle they got the head on the wrong side. You know, it happens pretty fast. Um, when you look at the video, which wasn't noted on the pitch side, they'd actually smack the head on the floor as well. So they've had one impact, two impacts. Again, just stuff that we're, we're looking for then. Well, luckily he stood up, but he wobbled his legs. He was, you know, very, very uneasy. So it's quite easy to, to sort of assess. And, and that's all information, which is fantastic to then, not for me to go, uh, you know, oh, by the way, this guy's he's fine or he's not fine. It's to me to share with the subject matter experts to go, right, you know, we're now hovering him off. They're now going to go into the medical room and do their, their full assessment. Are these head injuries commonplace? And again, that might sound a bit of a naive question, but are they commonplace? Because you mentioned the fact that there is time allocated to support head injuries. Yeah. In comparison to other sports, that's that doesn't really happen yeah. in in other um, invasion games. Yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued on, on, on the commonplace of it and, and how you anticipate maybe a certain yeah. thing to, to maybe impact the head. Yeah. In terms of number, you know... I mean, I've been through multiple games where there's maybe been one or something, um, and uh, and even then it wasn't particularly a high grade of concussion. So, but it's interesting you mentioned invasion games. Our sport is not an invasion game; it's a collision game. Okay, you are quite literally colliding with each other. You know, uh, and you look at the GPS data, and they're like having forty mile an hour car crashes. Some of them when they hit each other properly. Um, so you are, by distinction of the game, going to get head injuries you're also going to get shoulder injuries and sternum injuries and leg injuries you know um is it is it more than other sports i've, I've not seen any particular data to to suggest otherwise empirically and you know, on my own opinion i would suggest well there is going to be more because of the nature of the game and when again personal opinion but i don't think we're ever going to stop them you know unless you completely change the game and you can't tackle each other so you play touch play touch rugby um but it's a collision game. There are going to be injuries, yeah. you know, and that's where it maybe differs from the other sport, like your footballs. It's, yeah. it's an invasion. I'm going to invade your space, not necessarily come and clatter you. So therefore, you know, you're less likely to get injuries. I know I've, I've obviously seen some football tackles where they have been clatters, and you're going, yeah. Um, and it's not to say that they don't happen. Uh, was it the England Iran game with a yeah. goalkeeper? Yeah. You know, clearly. Uh, you know, I, I put my assessment on as I was watching the game, and I'm like, yeah, he's he's showing some high grade, uh, well, grade one, grade two sort of features here, and yet he was allowed to continue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know, and, and this is why what what we're doing at our bit to to support and have this stuff because they are going to happen. But then, how do we deal with it? How do we treat them? How do we best look after the players? Mm. You know, and that's that's always what it comes down to. And the more information we can have the better the better is to assess them the better is to treat them more accordingly you know do they have a do they have to have a two week off period yeah, which is standard and then uh, the reason why I'm being a bit thingy because there are some you know different elements that might make it could be a week depending upon how it's graded and stuff like that that gets common and that's not me by the way that's the doctor side so I just uh, you know but again we can appropriately treat just on your point, and I kind of bring you back because I'm interested where you where you were going with the comment around the ethical aspect of of this and okay. rule changes and yeah. and how we protect individuals. Yeah. Commonplace in the NFL, you see a lot of um, forward head injuries because yeah. uh, the impact that you mentioned, yeah. the term car crash, that yeah, 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 kind yeah. of epitomizes the point. Yeah. Is there a point where, from an ethical sense, you know, more needs to be done? around injuries and head injuries because whilst it might be a two-week period where there's a bit of a, a breathing space for that um, concussed individual to get back to normal is there a long-term effect on this is there anything that kind of has been explored within that and 
again, coming from an ethical point of view, that has to maybe be some form of potential modification if that is that if that's possible. If I answer one part of your question, yeah, that long yeah. that long term effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um that's obviously what people are starting to see. And you, you see it in football, don't you? About heading the ball a lot can potentially cause some yeah. uh, and it's been potentially linked to dementia and stuff like that. Um uh, I mean, again, I'm non medical, so I, I don't know the ins and outs of, of the sort of the long term and the ethical elements of it. But um, you know, the play, the players go onto the pitch and they know what may happen. You know, it's the same with boxing. You get into a boxing match, you know you're going to be punched in the head. Yeah. It's just then, can we follow the rules and make sure there's adequate treatment for them? Yeah. I don't think, ethically, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Because it's the game. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's still, still rules in place. You know, you can't have high tackles. You can't tackle... You know, I, can't, I couldn't just rub, you know, I mean, I'm speaking as a player then. I can't just run into somebody and whack around the head, you know, and then slam them to the ground and all the rest of it. I can't do that. Um, you know, some of it's why they've also got, they've absolutely whitewashed uh, punching. You know, it used to be quite commonplace on a rugby pitch for you to start punching. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I've, se I've seen it happen recently. But if it does, you're pretty screwed as a player. Do you think performance analysis, and this is going to probably be biased from, from your regard, but do you think it's it's effective then? Uh, and can you maybe give an example where analysis has been used effectively to support maybe these injuries that are, that, that, have, that have transpired? Yeah. Um, the, the, the best example I can think of, you know, off the bat anyway, is I see things that sometimes physios or S&Cs or anybody else miss. And it's not because they're not doing their job and they're looking and they're being does it. It's maybe because players are in the way. So a lot of mine are at ground level. You know, the doctors are at ground level. They may be like a step or two up. But I've got cameras which are high, so I never have players in the way, really. I have multiple angles. So, you know, there has been quite some... Or there has been some incidents. Um, nothing major, but still um, head knocks, trauma, um, where I've seen it on, on my screen. And I've gone, all oh, right, okay. And I'm expecting a doctor at the side of it for him to come in if they don't. And he's, again, it's not because I've missed anything. But that's when I have the power now to go out to the doctor and go, doctor, come in, I'll show you this. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where it's it's changed the game for the best. You know, the, for, me, for me, the better part. And I can see stuff. You know, and I often go, Let's, we'll assess the video again. We'll go through the protocols and stuff like that. And we'll go, and he was a great spot. I didn't see that. I go, yeah, it's, and it's not because he's, you know, picking his nose and you know, heading the you know, sky. It's because quite literally I have different viewpoints, you know, and, and the more angles I get, the more I'll see stuff, you know. Um, so I think for me, that's like one of the, the biggest benefits and, and where I can see it really having an impact on, you know, the assessments of it. We don't miss stuff now. No, no, I'm not saying we miss stuff, but, you know, it, it nothing goes yeah. through it and then, and it's done live as well. So it's not, oh, by the way, I've looked at the game a day or two after, but you've already been suffering headaches. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I've seen it now. Let's come in, assess it. Do, do we need to do something? Or do we need to just track it? Sometimes it's just a case of, right, we'll just, yeah, we'll know the time. We'll know what happened. And we'll track it. That's, that's what it is. Well, what's that process like then after the injury? So you mentioned... Uh, the doctor would step in, or there'd be a period where they have to come come away yeah. from sport. What 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 things would they be doing during that process to to get yeah. back to to normal? Yeah, so um, so let's say live. There's obviously myself and the doctor have assessed it. We're going to say right, we're going to get this person off off the pitch. Uh, they will come off. We will send a sub on who doesn't count within you within the substitutions, which I think is a really a really smart way of doing it. Um, they come off. I will also send the video clip to the doctor as well, so they've got it on their phone. Um, and then they're coming off. Again, I can't remember if it's 10 or 15 minutes, sorry. Um, they're going this, and they're doing what their protocols are. So they're asking specific questions, they're going, you know, uh, around the incident. They're trying to test their cognitive function, essentially. Um, they may do other physical uh, type elements with them. And they will say, yes, whether they are uh, able to return. And therefore, that sub gets reversed, or whether no, actually, sorry, you you're done for the rest of the game as a minimum. And then obviously they may have to go off for scans or 
just be chatting. It depends. On, everything's graded, you see. Um, so one is like the, the severe issues. Yeah. You are pretty much, you are out cold and you're, you know, you, you probably are going to miss two weeks of finger of uh, specific training. And then you have like a return to play within that last week as well. Yeah. Uh, which again is, is really smart for looking after players. They, they'll then do obviously all the tests as well during, during the week, as, as far as I'm aware, you know, to test their cognitive functions and stuff like that. Uh, which I think, I think it's, it's it's really, really good, really useful. Um, it's, it just adds value to, you know, to make them making decisions because that's ultimately my my aim. I need to help other subject matter experts, whether it be a physio or finger. If I was with a coach, I might help them as well. Um, I allow them to make better decisions for objective, yeah. Uh, processing if you will well, what about the relationship with the athletes so there, there might be an athlete that has a head injury and they don't feel the impact of it yeah. they want to proceed yeah. in the, the game and the adrenaline and everything else kind of takes over yeah. but you have to tell them that they can't or the doctor has to tell them that yeah. they can't and then they use maybe your footage to kind of yeah. prove that is, is there ever, yeah. ever been disagreements or anything along those yeah, lines yeah. and just to add to that has there ever, ever been coaches that have maybe caused conflict within that as well yeah. Um, yeah. quick answer for coaches no no, no. So no. they're they're fully invested in the yeah. process. Then. The, the doctor is the one who gets the overall say okay. for all of this. It is it's purely the doctor. Um, you know, if the doctor walks on the pitch as well, the game stops. You know, irrespective of what's going on, the game really? stops. Yeah, it's, it, the doctor has that um, that power and that right, uh, and, and quite right for so. So, a coach, you know, nothing there. And, and you know, the coaches and doctors have a great relationship with each other. Is, is the doctor neutral? between the two clubs or would you have a no. club doctor yeah club doctor okay uh, yeah so we have we have ours and then obviously the away ones okay. we've got theirs as well so there's a sense of rapport and trust yeah. being built up through that absolutely yeah, yeah. you know there's yeah co coach wise there's just nothing um, but yeah it's really interesting you mentioned the other part um, if I give an example for the whole game again I won't mention names but you know it's, it was on Sky everybody saw it um, <laughs> yeah well, one of the whole players has been absolutely out out cold he's posturing on the floor as well which was a bit concerning what does oh, that mean uh posturing so he goes stiff like a board okay and then uh, you know they're, they're giving a little bit of wobble and stuff but yeah okay. he goes stiff like a board hands in the air you know and then you're sort of moving rocking like that's and that's called posturing that means right. you're pretty you know he, there's problems <laughs> um i'll laugh again because again he was okay he was fine um yeah so i've seen this on the thing we've gone through the full process uh, their club doctor went on. Like, other doctors come in. We're assessing the footage. What's happened? Points of contact. Did he protect himself? No, he did not. Uh, his secondary, you know, for the whole things. Um, and this guy was out, uh, you know. Anyway, so, but, you know, being rugby players as well, maybe there is that side of it. They like to walk off the pitch. I like to stand up and he did. You know, there was nothing wrong with his, uh, you know, obviously his spine's cleared as well from the doctors out there. So for that, and he stood up, walked off. Um, and where I sit, he actually walked behind me. Um, and he come over to me. He was like, hey, mate, you okay? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. You all right? Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, can you, you all right just to show me what, what's happened? I might have like a perfectly normal conversation about what's going on. And I was happy to show him. It's, you know, it's not a problem. I, I obviously made sure that he's all right seeing it because some people don't like it, but, you know. Yeah. He's happy, yeah, yeah. So we went for it, did it. He said, "Oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, I can see that now. I can see that, you know." So, he, and it was strange because he was potentially one of them who was that coherent enough that you might have gone, Do you know, what we couldn't, we have this opportunity to chuck him back on. But at the same time, the system allowed us to say he's out cold. You know, he's probably not going to return, um, and. You know, also as well, when they're that coherent, sometimes if they get a secondary concussion, a secondary knock, that can be where the real problems happen. Right. Um, I've seen one recently. Um, I don't know how recent, but it was in uh, MMA or kickbox K9. It was one of them types of combat sports where uh, a person's been delivered uh, an illegal punch to the back of the head. Um, the doctors come on. And this is no disrespect for the doctors or anything like that, but the guy was coherent, really, really coherent, and he's doing all the stuff. Anyway, he's allowed him to go back on. Um, and again, from the footage I've seen and stuff like that, um, he, he lost the fight. He was, you know, he was done. 
And I, I believe now he's he potentially in a wheelchair, this guy. Wow. Because of that secondary head element to it, you know. Um, and, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is not knocking the doctor because, you know, it, uh, at the time that was what was presented to him, you know. Um, but it is that secondary element of it, which is the danger more than the first one. You know, we can treat the first one, we can look after it and it can, everything's appropriate. But, you know, and, and the reason why I maybe talk about this as well, especially like for grassroots levels. So any rugby league or any other sport particularly, if somebody's showing, they've took a head knock and they're showing, ah, oh, yeah, I'm fine, let's have this conversation. Don't put them back on. You know, leave them off, please. Play a welfare, play a safety. You know, I'm not going to say that they're going to end up in a wheelchair or die or, die or anything, but just that play welfare elements the the key elements of it i think people sometimes forget the duty of care is kind of the key first thing that you yeah. and have to know um, and, and on that in terms of what you said um i presume that the fact that analysis is involved brings some form of objectivity yeah and it's the doctor's opinion like you said and it's the doctor's um right to either take this player on or off is there ever, ever still kind of subjectivity involved within that is there cases where you question why a person's still on or you maybe question that the person continue to play I, i'm just yeah. trying to kind of think about how the yeah. the objective nature comes in within analysis yeah. for, for me my role um i get again being non-medical i've never argued with the doctors i've never gone no, no, no. the only times that we sort of have little uh discussions because that's all they are um is about like where maybe the point of contact was you know, was it a jaw or was it a temple? Was it just a cheek? You know, and sometimes that's the, you know, we're going, is it his cheek? You know, or is it his temple? Because that's, you know, uh, if he's busted his cheek, he potentially, you know, if it's still fixated, it's in the right place and there's still, you know, functioning cognitively, there's opportunity to carry on. But your temple, you know, you, you're likely, it's one of them soft spots as, as is your chin. Um, so we've sort of had debates around that were, but never I've never once thought oh that person shouldn't be on but, oh well, that, that person's you know pushing it here you know the, the complete trust is with with the doctors yeah and I think the last thing they wanted to do is chuck somebody back on the pitch who they're not you know because they're all they're also they have a relationship with the players you know they don't want to be chucking their, I don't want to say friends but it could be that back onto then subsequently have further damage and injuries and yeah. stuff. So no, there's there's never been that. And, but like you like you've inter, you know made there about uh, interlinked about it's objective and there's none of this. Oh, was it that? Was it this? Was it not? We've now got video footage with some you know evidence and we can zoom in as well, which is a new function that's just come up. Zoom in, we can highlight things. We can go through it. It's yeah. dead dead objective. Where do you see this going then, Randall? Uh, and, and maybe think of this from maybe like a, a, a sport as a whole, and obviously your lens has been rugby league, but where do you think yeah. this goes in terms of looking at sport within, yeah. with using analysis and kind of using injury as maybe a, a, a key point yeah. in terms of protecting players and a, yeah. we said duty of care. Where do you think this might go with new technologies and AI and everything else? Yeah. And that is apparent yeah. in today's society. Where, yeah. where, where do you think this might lead? Um, I, I don't really have too much on AI in terms of injuries. I think that might take more of a technical, tactical element for coaches. Um, but one of the advancements at the moment that, that's looking at being developed is gum shields, which have sensors in them, which can tell how much force has been applied to the head, for example. Um, I believe it's been tested in the NFL. Um, they're having some problems because they wear helmets that, and the helmets rattle. So it causes force, obviously. Um, but I think that's, you know, become really, really useful tool. Um, I believe it is, they are being now trialled over here in rugby league. Um, and again, to show us force, because the GPS is fine, but it's where's that force gone through? Has it gone through your sternum, your finger? Has it gone through your head? It doesn't, it just shows a force. But the gum shields will show force through the head. Um, and then therefore we'll have a metric. So at some point, I will be able to sit there with the... Uh, the software, you know, the video, and at the side of it, I will also have uh, the gum shield data to suggest, okay, this is how much force has been applied. Um, which uh, that's what I can see, sort of technologically wise, being driven. Um, maybe, and the, and you know, there may be more other medical instruments that come along um, to then sort of 
you know, sort of assess players and stuff like that. Um, maybe uh, Alice Waters with some VR people. Maybe you could then, you pull a person off, you put VR goggles on them. Can they do some sort of cognitive tests? Yeah. You know, um, but I mean, you know, that was, that, that's down the line and it may, it may not happen. It's me, me just sort of just going off there. Um, so yeah, so technology wise, I think it'll drive some bits like that and it'll allow me to have some, some data to, to assess as well. Um, I think in other sports, I think they'll start to adopt some of this. Um, and the reason why I say that is, um, I spoke to some, uh, scouts who were at Coventry. Um, uh, I think they've, they've gone to, or they have gone to other, other places now. Um, and I talked about what I did and I talked about the indie assessments and, the, and you know, cause they might look at it from a, a talent ID type of role. Um, and they were like, wow, I can't believe we, you know, yeah. this, and they went, that's going to be big, you know? So, um, I mean, I, I don't know if football does anything like I do anyway. I've, I've not seen anybody, but I can see potentially all the sports having to do stuff like this or, and also wanting to do it without player welfare. It could, for me, for me, it's a standalone sort of role, but there's no reason why it couldn't be tagged on to somebody who's already doing PA and doing the stats and data and stuff like that. And then it gets sent to a thing. So it might look differently process wise, but I can certainly see a lot of sports, hopefully, you know, taking up this injury assessment through performance analysis yeah. and, and other functions. So do you think that will grow the industry then in, in terms of analysis? Obviously, it's quite uh, con early in contemporary in comparison to other disciplines. Do you think that might grow then in terms of the nature of how we can analyse certain features? Because there's always a um, focus on, especially at elite level, is like winning. What can we do to, to use yeah. analysis to win? But I think yeah. with what you've said, it's what can we do to protect? And I'm just, it's yeah. interesting how that kind of aligns with yeah. how the industry might grow. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I would say some of it still happens anyway, but it's just then to get to what level and how effective yeah. and stuff like that. You know, the, the role that's uh, I've been given at St. Helens is, you know, fantastic out this world. I see it working and doing this, that, and the other. Um, I can certainly see it becoming, and hopefully, a sort of an individualized area within other sports. You know, could it be that a medical professional sort of takes over what I do, you know, and they can then interlink it with what, you know, so I'm not saying there's no need for me, but, you know, or even if I became a little bit more medical, maybe I could start doing other things as well, other assessments, other things while doctors are doing other things that I pick side. So, yeah, it, it does have that potential to, mm -hmm. to go out and wide and then, uh, yeah. But, I mean, the thing always with medical is, is obviously quite a lot of, it's strict with medical. So as soon as you have transitions from PA into medical side, you know, it's very, I don't want to say red tape, but it, it is for very much reasons because it is that player protection. Yeah. When you talk, when I talked about the BA, VR guys, I said to you, could you put a goggles on and go, right, um, I can now assess your cognitive functions and therefore whether you've got a concussion or not. And they were like, technically, yeah, we could, I suppose we could set up but then it has to go through, it then becomes a medical apparatus. So therefore it needs different, you know, approvals and this, that and the other. So I don't think that's why they were keen to take it on. Mm. But, um, but I can see it still having some development there, you know, maybe within the VR world, maybe just look a bit different. Um, yeah. And then obviously other roles and stuff like that coming out from it, um, which are very, very specific player welfare driven. You know, I obviously archive everything as well. So there's that longevity of stuff as well. Yeah. You know, and I think, yeah, I, I certainly, I would, I would hope so. I don't, anything to protect the players to yeah. that. You know, their players put, the, the whole players put their bodies on the line. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think it's, it's right that we, if we can care for them better, then yeah, perfect. What about your relationship with coaches then? Is there, is there, is there a strong connection between how that's integrated? And we kind of agreed with that from our conversation, but in terms of using you as an integral part in that process, yeah. how do you find that? So could, and the reason I ask is people might be listening and watching this that want to kind of get a little bit of insight of what it's like within kind of backroom staff, etc. Yeah. What, what's it like to kind of work with different multidisciplinary teams and how that you can support them and better yeah, them? Yeah. yeah um, I, I mean, sort of current, currently in my role at St. Helens, I'm not always around the coaches and stuff like that. I am quite literally, uh, physios uh sort of like i don't know uh, 
So I was going to say water boys because on the day sometimes they do carry the water as well, <laughs> but they're not. Uh, you know, like the masseurs and the, the obviously the doctors. Those are my sort of three, three or four sort right, of yeah. main people. But I know Wello. I used to know him, and you know we know each other, and we know what we're doing and stuff like that. So I think he sort of buys into it and stuff like that. Um, he's yeah, I know that he likes performance analysis, you know, and can obviously use it within some capacity himself as well. Um, so yeah, but again, maybe it's just the the, the role of it, because well, I only really do match days as well, so I I don't turn up to all the trains. I, I do, by the way, I like to go down and watch and you know in, yeah. interact with people. Um, but generally, my only role is at home matches, so I turn up and I have a specific role with specific people. But yeah, I, have, I think they do have a buy-in. They do like the analysis. You know, I still get um, assistant coaches coming over and asking questions technically and tactically yeah you know with that um so you know and then yeah i think we, we have an understanding and it's a good understanding yeah you know, we're, we're friends obviously and all that sort of stuff, yeah. yeah and obviously your friend craig richard, richard is obviously <laughs> part of the women's team as well um I, I, I get the feeling that there's a sense of maybe a, a good sense of community where you do learn off each other quite well yeah. within rugby and you mentioned your, your medical staff as, as well did you get that is, is that the kind of feeling that's within rugby clubs is that there's a sense of togetherness a sense of belonging and everyone is welcome within that yeah I, I think there can be is, and that's, that's quite an interesting question you know I, I know I can walk over to other clubs PAs and start having a chat with them you know Salford's PA I was, I was talking to him quite a bit and we just talk about processes and talk about you know, we're not giving secrets away and stuff like that, but, you know, if we we're talking about, oh, look, how are you using it? What software are you using? Oh, what do you think of this upgrade? What yeah. do you think of that? Uh, you know, so there is that sort of camaraderie within, obviously within my other clubs as well, and there's, and there's a respect probably, or maybe not camaraderie. Yes, there, there's certainly yeah. respect there, and we, um, you know, and yeah, we do, we do get along and stuff like that. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, because sometimes... Um, Football clubs or other sports, and the reason I say football clubs is because obviously, yeah, yeah, it's kind of my area of where I've been in. But th there's an element of fairness of sharing information because yeah. one's going to get yeah. one over the other, and yeah, it brings that kind of environment where good practice yeah. is not shared significantly well. And I presume, obviously, within your case, is that, and as we've mentioned, that there's a there's a wellness factor. Yeah, good practice needs to be shared to support yeah. the, the the sport as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, from from that point of view, and obviously I work with the other doctor, you know, and what we're doing isn't a secret, you know. And I think that's I think that's what it is, though. I think like in football, particularly, you know, and, and some of my experiences with football is like everything is a secret, but like I, somebody could sit down, watch a couple of your games, and know exactly what you're doing. Yeah, you know, and you know, technically and tactically, you know, it's not that much of a secret. Yeah, and probably the processes that you're doing. When you know you go to huddle, you speak to them. They're probably oh well, they're doing that. Huddle. Yeah, it's like what's well, the process is the same. You know the 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 secret bits are coming on them fine details. You know oh we're actually also doing this. And, you know that's the secrets, but nobody shares them. But you know, I think I think within rugby league because it's such a more small sport, you know it does become that. And as well, I know like if I give somebody an SDI feed, you know like. For, from another club the chances are when I oh I, you know I'm not speaking now but you know if I went to another club have you got a feed yeah yeah here's your feed you know you work with each other you know as well if you come and give them nothing and you know you're more, they're more likely to just you yeah. know give you nothing um, so I think maybe but maybe that's the nature of the sport because it's something smaller it's, you know the community is a bit more smaller and yeah uh, it's so far I mean don't get there's, there's still obviously some teams which <laughs> Just the thing, yeah, I'd like to feel a whole way not one of them, but uh, well, that's a culture of sport, right? Yeah, and that could be we could do another episode completely, on <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So that going to culture, the micro politics and relationships, etc. But now it's just intri interesting how you mentioned that for, for those that might be listening or watching, um, might be intrigued in analysis and actually have, have kind of maybe engaged with this podcast because they've seen it from a different perspective. Yeah, what advice would you give to maybe those that are wanting to kind of go into this area? Um, uh, and make a career out of it is there anything that stands out in terms of the reflection of your experiences um, it might sound a bit cliche but the network 
you know, everybody gets in clubs, whether it's football, rugby, rugby union, whatever, through people you know. Um, you know, so that that would be my thing to to just to develop a network. But that's that's sort of like superficial. I think the next thing you need to do is actually um find friends within it. You know, I mean you mentioned Greg Richards before, like, you know, I do classify him as a friend even though I may not admit it. Um but because of that, I now I got my link in to St. Helens. Right. You know, it wasn't because he was just uh, a networking pal or a networking friend. You know, it was, uh, you know, he was a friend, sorry. It wasn't just somebody on LinkedIn. He was a friend and therefore. So I would, I would say develop relationships with these people you network with. So start with your network, develop them relationships, you know, because then you have that way in. You know, and, and if people then, if you can develop your IT skills to learn how to use software and program software, that's the first protocol, you know. So then I've got somebody who knows me, knows I can use a computer, you know. I think that's the first bit. Um, then, you know, then you need to develop, right, how do you analyze stuff? Because that's a whole other ball game. Um, I know I've obviously mentioned some processes, but they're like, that's just a stone, you know, the the foundation at the bottom. Um, but that's what you need to then develop. All right. Um, how do I actually assess this? You know, what am I going, what am I using any academic models? If, you know, if I maybe mention some of them, am I using academic models? Am I, uh, you know, what am I doing? Um, and then for me, the last one, probably the biggest thing is you got to have these soft skills, know how to talk to people, you know, know how to, go over to this person and give them a bit of a bollocking I can go over to this person and I've got to be really gentle with them you know have them people skills it's alright being at a computer but what am I going to do turn the computer on and go yeah no I need to interact with people and I think that can get lost with analysis sometimes yeah. especially with data analysis because you can quite literally just be sat at a computer pushing buttons and you know obviously mouse stuff send your data through you know, and they do a fantastic job by the way, the data they collect out of this world. Um, but if you're going to sort of wanting to go and develop yourself and be head of performance analyst, etc., but to have these other roles, you need not to interact with people. Yeah, and I think that can sometimes get lost in this. It's, it's interesting how you say that. And again, speaking to previous members on this podcast, they mentioned the element of applying academic knowledge within certain environments and they say sometimes that lacks transparency because the culture and knowing people and how people work uh is not necessarily aligned with the the theory yeah. and that might be the same case with what you say about data you've got all this data which is good yeah. but it's applying that and, and getting to know people sometimes that can be lost and yeah. forgotten about and i'm just intrigued on how you say it yeah you say that as as, as you as a as an analyst in the field yeah yeah i think it's it's key um I get like well like with my old uh, head coach deck, you know, fantastic guy, but computer wise, not great skills. You know, I hope he doesn't mind me saying that. Um, coach out of his world, but so like, but if I go to him and I throw a lot of stuff in front of him, it's like, oh, what the hell's this? And you know, I'm gonna almost be against it, and you can't do that. So again, people skills deck. Let me just show you this part. This is all I need to show you. Show it, and then are we gonna run with it? Or are we not? Are we yeah. Gonna, uh, yeah, people skills. As well, I can go up to Craig Richards, I bet I could throw a lot more in front of him and go, all right, I think. You know, you get that and that's that knowing how to, uh, yeah, just speak to people. Like, players, players are so, can be so vulnerable. You say one bad thing to them, it affects the whole game. Yeah. You know, and, or you can say something really small, sharp and pretty and all of a sudden it's like, wow, they go out of this world and, yeah, and I think that's, it is, it is vital for, for players and coaches and as analysts. And then if, if you don't mind me tagging it on as well, um, I think the role of analyst is going to change. You're almost, especially within Football League, you're almost going to be a coaching analyst. You know, you look at some jobs now in, in football as well, they want you to have a UEFA B licence because you're not just going to be the cameraman like you, you mentioned. You, you're quite literally now going to go, right, Dummy analysis, I know my software, I know how to break stuff down, transcribe, uh, link stuff together and go, right, now let's go on the pitch. So if I link that to the yeah. final question, sure, yeah. 
Uh, and the final question is very much going to be a, a, around that. And, and also relating this to yourself is where do you see this going? But also where do you see your role going yeah. alongside the industry and how things are advancing yeah. and the nature of uh, head injuries and the nature of uh, using performance analysis tools to kind of support player yeah. care. Where, where do you see this going? Yeah. If, you, if you were to put your feet up in how yeah. many years? I won't yeah, ask yeah, you yeah, ages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what kind of things do you think will transpire over the next couple of phases within your area? Um, I think like obviously the long term effects will go. You know, so we'll we'll have like five, ten years worth of data to suggest some effects, and then players who then retire and then obviously they get older as well. You know, are, do they start to show signs of dementia, blah blah blah, or any other things? And then can that be linked back? Um, I can certainly see that becoming like a part of the role. Um, but the thing is, like this, this role, while like, pretty new. Like I've been doing it for well a full season, and we're halfway through the second season. It's, it's, I don't know where it's going to go. You know, it could go everywhere. It, may, it might even be tagged on to somebody in the end, and it disappears. Uh, I hope not. Um, you know, I, and I, it might sound like a bit of a cop out answer, but it is just that brand new. This is a brand new role. You know, sounds have been great in setting it up. Um, because I know other clubs don't specifically have somebody for my role that gets tagged on somewhere else, or it's a, it's through technology, um, as video feed, as video replays only, you know. Um, so yeah, where it goes, I, I don't particularly know. Is there anything that you want to achieve within within the role that you're in? Is there anything that you've kind of set out? For me, I I would like to to tag it with the technical and tactical side. And this is maybe because it's purely rugby league. So with football, I wouldn't, I would keep my role as a separate entity. I think it would have other benefits, but I would like to take it with the technical and tactical side. So can I get my data streamed? Uh, you know, to have all the technical and tactical bits we need, then I can tag injuries below. I can then send footage to doctors and physios, the stuff I've got the, uh, in rugby league, we believe or not, we have the coach at the side of us. For her as analysts, you know, it's not like they're on the, the touchline, yeah. you know, so I could also do stuff for them, you know, do I need to send stuff to, to, I think it might end up becoming this, I don't want to say a central hub. And then what you do is you allow other subject matter experts to make clearer, better, more concise decisions. Yeah. Then as well, you put it in stuff in front of players, you add in to their cognitive excellence. So what you're showing and going through with them, et cetera, they can then apply on the pitch directly, straight from half time. Half time much this bro gotta apply it. You know, um I think that's something I would like to explore as well as tagging the injury side to it. Because can it be done? You know, or is it its own specific specialist subject area? Um, which I think it is, but you know, looking at other principles and you know, having a central hub person, you know, as, as the head analyst, if you will, to go, right, linked with other subject matter experts, what do they want, what do they want, what do they want, and how can we all link to have sort of this efficient uh, decision-making platform, if I can call it that, yeah, to therefore affect the game. Yeah. And then performances and whilst looking after players, you know, can I look after their welfare as well as, you know, watch them, Technically, they also need to do this, you know. And I think that would be really interesting if it if it transpires that way. And you know, that's maybe where I'm prob probably going with my PhD as well. You know, is the analyst the the link between everybody? You know, or does everybody just do their own role and analysis squeezes in somewhere, or does it not squeeze in somewhere? Does it become redundant with AI? I don't think it will. By the way, <laughs> no. Uh, the video analyst, I think he said it won't become redundant. So I didn't see. I think he just said it will alter what the performance yeah. analysts do. It advance it. Yeah. And I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that state. For those that are interested yeah. in head injuries analysis or even maybe just to kind of reach out, where can they find you? Um, Sometimes on Twitter. I don't often use it. Uh, but yeah, sometimes Twitter, uh, Randall57, I think it is. Yeah. Um, 
and that's really my only platform. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn. Do you use LinkedIn? I don't. I have it, but I don't particularly use it. I sort of accept people, and <laughs> we may message, but um, yeah, I might be. Uh, you know what I mean? So if somebody messages, I may reply, but I really, yeah, I'm really just a, a Twitter guy, and I don't really use that so much. Yeah. I try to stay off the socials. Well, what we'll do is we'll put your contact details in the description for anyone wants to yeah, yeah. maybe reach out or if anyone's inspired by this conversation. Um, from my own personal point of view, Randall, I just want to say thank you yeah. for, for joining the podcast. It's intriguing to hear um, just perceptions really on, on head injuries and how they're, they're apparent and how, from a personal point of view, novice we are maybe as, as, a, as an industry right. uh, around us understanding the process of it and then the fact that you said that there was you know one to two years as a, as a new role yeah uh, more emphasize that point but um good luck thank you uh hopefully it continues hopefully ai don't take the job <laughs> 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 yeah. and uh thank you yeah thank no, you thank you, you. Me, thank you.